So welcome everybody. I'm Molly Heffernan, Director of Marketing for the Tory Birch Foundation, and this is our small business webinar program. Today, we are digging into an amazing topic, how do I fund my business? Um, I think it's a question we get asked all the time. Um, today is a little bit of a different format. If you've been with us, normally you see a presentation, you're like scrambling to take notes, but today we're having a conversation. We have three founders who have figured out how to fund their businesses. They've all gone about it in totally different ways. Um, and they're going to share their advice with us. Um, please note, because they're sharing and digging in and getting personal with us, we're not recording today's session. Um, I have some questions that you all submitted, and I'm going to use those to get us started. We're going to have plenty of time for Q&A. So make sure you drop your questions in the Q&A box. We don't want to miss them because as you can see, that chat is moving quick. <laughs> you all are a big community. Um, so really to kick us off today, um, everyone tuning in, you may have heard us talk about our funding finder and finding funding in general, but our funding finder is really a, an assessment tool that helps small businesses get guidance on what type of capital is right and works best for their company based on current stage and what they want to do in the future. We wanted to kind of bring that tool to life today and have that same conversation with founders. Um, so check out Funding Finder on our website. More than a thousand of you have already used it um, to start your funding journey, figure out what's right, and mirror that tool and your results with the insights you're getting from today's session. So what are we doing? We have three amazing Tory Birch Foundation entrepreneurs. We have Claudia, Ramona, and Caitlin with us. Um, they all have participated in various programs from the Tory Birch Foundation and are going to share all about their funding journey. When starting out, they self-funded, and we're going to hear a little bit about what they've each learned along the way, how they're funding now, and advice for you all tuning in. Um, in an effort to be conscious of time and everything, I'm going to dig right in and introduce everyone as I go, and you're going to learn a little bit about their businesses as we ask these questions. So why don't we get started? And I'm going to first kick off with Ramona. Ramona, you have been to our webinars before as a speaker. You are the founder of Fibric, an accounting firm. Take note, everybody, an accounting firm that mm -hmm. focuses on small businesses. You led that great bootstrapping webinar for us earlier in the fall. And when you first started self-funding your business, what were the most important financial models and formulas you were thinking about to self-fund? Thank you, Molly. And hello, everyone. Super excited to be back. I love this programming. I love everything that Desiree, Ali, and Molly are doing. So very happy to be here. I, you know, one of the, I'm a conservative when it comes to money. Like I need to feel secure. I need to feel that uh, I am, you know, I, I have a safety net. And so when I started my firm, so scared the first few months, I was so much concerned, so so concerned with making sure that I had enough money to keep myself, you know, from getting broke, going broke. So I, the important thing for me at the time was to have enough savings. So I saved a little bit of money before I decided to start my business, because as a service provider, a lot of you most likely know this. We don't get a lot of funding from investors, right? Unless you have a super innovative service company that's going to use technology. A lot of times legal firms, accounting, event planners, we are self-funded. So we, I needed to save initially, but also I reached out to my family and my friends to tell them what I was doing just in case, right? I, I had my savings, but just in case I needed a loan, just in case anyone needed to chip in in some way. Uh, the other thing I did that was also important was to make sure that my credit was in amazing, uh, in an amazing position. And the way I do this, anytime I'm going to make a large purchase, like buying a home or a car, I review what my credit looks like. And if it's not where I think it should be for that next thing that I'm going to do, 
I take steps to make sure that it improves. So having good credit at the beginning of the business was important in case I needed to open a new credit card, which I did for the business, personal loans, business loans, if I was able to do that. So those were the things, savings, my credit, and making sure my family was around just in case I needed an emergency loan. Amazing. Well, that is, those are some really tangible things that everybody getting started can, can consider. Um, and we're going to come back. I have many follow-up questions, but I want to move over to Claudia real quick. So Claudia, you're the founder of Hugo Coffee, a roaster that supports animal rescue across the country. And you launched when you were 55 years old and you tapped into your retirement to start the company. What advice do you have for founders who maybe are considering starting in the same way? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here today. I, I am here to make sure that everybody on this call does not do some of the things I did. But one of the smart things I did, and by the way, I'm also the opposite of Ramona. I am not financially conservative, clearly, like crazily not financially conservative. And you want to be more financially conservative than me. Um, and I, de I definitely agree with the good credit and all that. So how I started my business, it actually was twofold. Because I was 55, and I'm a, I'm a reformed attorney, so I was an attorney for 25 years. And then I went into CPG, like what? But anyway, um, so because I was a 55 year old attorney, I had a house. So I got a home equity line of credit to, in the amount of $125,000 when I first started. I then got, went through that money obviously. And then I, in, I went into my 401k. Um, my advice for when you start a company, particularly if you're starting a manufacturing company, is you need a good budget, you need a good cash flow projection. I did not have that. And as a result, I was always looking for money, always looking for money. But you need a good budget and cash flow projection because cash is king and cash flow is queen. Amazing. Well, that is incredible advice. Couldn't be more accurate. And listen, what you're doing um, is so important. And I, I know some of us may see Hugo, the inspiration for your company in the background. Yes. Um, so, it, you know, heart was in the right place and you got to have the financials in the right place too. Um, Caitlin, I want to move on to you. Your business is the Lotus Method, which provides pre and postnatal fitness. You started your company in 2014 in San Francisco. Uh, you've recently opened in New York City, as we were just talking about, which is amazing. Um, and last year, you raised money to open that location. So congratulations across the board. Thank you. How, of course. How did you first approach saving to start that business, especially in 2014? Like, what was that process like for you? Yeah, um, I have a slightly different story, maybe a little closer to Ramona, where I did not dip into personal savings because I was pretty young. And I think I was 29 when I started the business and a personal trainer didn't have a lot of cash in the bank. I had the privilege that my parents were able to loan me my first loan um, because like Ramona said, service businesses, really rare to be able to get that from a bank especially in the beginning. <laughs> um, so I pitched my parents, showed them the whole business plan, did the whole bit, um, got them on board. They gave me 30,000, which if anyone in the audience has a brick and mortar business like mine can attest, that's not a lot of money for a brick and mortar studio. <laughs> um, but I was a baller on a budget and I made it work. I found a turnkey location. Um, I think one of the biggest things for me is I basically already kind of tested product market fit. I had a customer base that I had kind of like imported from the gym I was previously working at of pre and postnatal women. So I had tested that this offering was needed, wanted, validated. And then I was able to transfer that over. So I automatically had revenue coming in the door. Day one was cash flow positive from that perspective. Um, so with a little bit of hustle, a little bit of money, I was able to make it work. And then from there, I've raised almost 2 million to date, um, primarily from clients and angel investors. Well, 
Caitlin, that you couldn't have teed that up better. It does lead into the next question. <laughs> next question. Uh, okay. Next question, which is, you know, for everyone watching, angel investors maybe are something that you all have thought about or you might be familiar with, but just to ground us, angel investors are often private high net worth individuals who are willing to provide financial backing to a small business in exchange for equity. Mm -hmm. So Caitlin, as you mentioned, you were securing fundraising from angels, from clients at your studio. How, how did you decide that that was the right process for your business and that you were going to be willing to, to share equity in the company? Yeah. Um, well, actually the first round I did, and I think one of my maybe piece of advice to small, uh, small business owners is be flexible with your funding approach. Cause I actually did a revenue participation note. I wasn't quite ready. I didn't know I could get them the return from equity at that point. I had one studio. Um, I knew I wanted to open another one, but I kind of started off small. Um, so I did a revenue participation note where investors got um, 2% of revenue off the top. And that worked well because I was cash flow positive. I wasn't ready to give up equity at that point. Um, since then, I have raised pure equity. Um, and the way I kind of found and found my investors was having people that already knew the business, that loved it, um, getting people that really understood it. And it's typically from your own like nucleus, right? Somebody who knows somebody, um, a client who talks to somebody. And what I would do is just kind of like openly just talk about it, like that I was looking to open another location that I was funding and just kind of putting that out in the atmosphere. And you don't get what you don't ask for. So putting that out there in the universe and then it would kind of like come back around. Mm -hmm. And I guess a quick follow-up on that is, you know, if, if there was something that you learned through that process, through getting vulnerable, through making those asks, what would you say that it was that you think everyone else, they're going to take one thing away from that investor process? What would it be? Yeah. Um, I think connecting to your why and being able to story tell and really tell people your why that's going to be the best way for someone to connect to your business. So if you have a strong why of why you're starting this, who you're trying to impact, um, that really made a big difference in being able to get people to promote or, or invest in a small business. Um, and a lot of our clients and investors, we were their first investment, which is really unique. Like they weren't typical angel investors. Um, but they believed in what we did. They believed they saw, you know, if they were a client themselves, they felt it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that made a big difference. Um, just connecting to the why, being able to tell that, um, having a very clear vision of where you want to take the company, especially if you're raising pure equity, you need to have a story of how you're going to get them a return and what that multiple is going to be. So you need to be able to story tell that. You need to have um benchmarks that show how you're going to be able to get there um i've also done tranche deals where i've done equity but i let people come in for a, sh a small amount of money and then i let them say hey let me prove it to you over the next year i'm going to let you invest over the next year for the same valuation but we're going to set up milestones so you can put in a little bit now i'm going to prove myself you put in a little more i'm going to prove myself you're going to put in more um that's another way to kind of like bridge that confidence chasm for investors. Um, so I've gotten really being a small business and maybe not a technical, like um, a typical VC funded company. I've had to get creative on how I raise in this environment, how you raise in different kind of deal structures. That's great, Caitlin. And I think, you know, to, to summarize being creative, there is not just one way to secure the funding. Know that why and and really bring your client, your customer, your community on that journey with you. Yeah. Um, Claudia, I want to jump back to you. Um, so 
CDFIs. This is a term, an acronym that gets thrown around a lot. Those are community development financial institutions. They provide loans, credit, financial services to people that often mainstream banks are not normally lending to. Right. And Claudia, you turned uh, to a variety of funding strategies to grow the business, including CDFIs. Yes. What was that process like? Oh, CDFIs, I just like find the CDFI near you. Find the CDFI nearest to you and go to them. So I went to two CDFIs. One is called Mount Lands Association of Governments in Utah. So it covers three um, counties. It provides um, economic development dollars. That's its intent. So it's meant to to grow. You know, it's meant to spur economic development in those three counties. I got the biggest loan they ever gave to anybody from that organization. I got one hundred twenty five thousand dollars. Um, and it was a five-year fixed and it was an 8%. So it was a good loan. That's a good debt right there. Five-year fixed, 8%. That's a good one. I also went to a company called the Utah Micro Loan Fund. Now, its mission is to support disadvantaged businesses, BIPOC, vets, et cetera. I got their maximum as well. I got 50000 from them. Now, this is over time. Like I didn't do all this at once. Um, then one thing that was very interesting happened last year when I was totally stressed and freaking out that I needed to raise money very quickly. I had an epiphany while walking Hugo and I thought, well, wait a sec. I got 125 grand from MAG four years ago. I only owe them like 30 now. Maybe they'll give me the difference again. So I called them and I said, can you give me that 95 again? And they said, sure. So they did. And I did the same thing to Utah Micro Loan Fund. So I have I just refinanced the same loan and I got another five year fixed for 8% interest. And I did the same thing with Utah Micro Loan Fund. Now, Claudia, it's clear you are an amazing storyteller um, <laughs> and infectious. What did you do to actually, when you're in the door, you're meeting with the CDFI, how did you prepare? Like, how did you, I mean, listen, not take my money, but still, how did you convince them? Well, what's interesting is sometimes CDFIs are um, super touchy feely and sometimes they're like shark tanks, like you never know. So one of the CDFIs, that MAG one I went to, my husband got a MAG loan a million years ago and they were more like touchy feely. By the time I showed up, they were like shark tank. So I brought my CFO to describe the cash flow analysis and you know when I was gonna be profitable and blah, blah, blah. Uh, bear in mind, CDFIs are meant to fill in the blank when you aren't commercial bank ready, right? You are, you are, maybe you're a disadvantaged business, you're a small business. Small businesses have a really hard time finding capital. We just do. Female founded small businesses have a really hard time finding capital. CDFIs often exist to bridge that gap. So they tend, the underwriting tends not to, it's not going to be the same level as a commercial bank, which is excellent. And it's not going to be as, as you know, ridiculous as fintech companies where all they want to see are your bank statements, which is no underwriting, and that's ridiculous. So mm -hmm. it's, it tends to be a little, it depends on the CDFI. I always had my CFO with me. One time I did it for marketing dollars, so I had my CMO with me to explain what the marketing was going to do, none of which happened, by the way, but um, I got the money. Um, there is such a golden nugget in what you just said, which is bring you know, you brought the people in the room to have the conversations that you maybe were like, no, the CMO is better at that marketing talk. Oh, yeah. We all think we have to go it alone. And even if you don't have a full team and you're a solo founder, bring, get the advice before the meeting, bring the person that you need to bring into the room. It's so important. We don't have to be in isolation in this process. Yeah. Um, I was there to tell the story of my brand. Yeah. What my mission is, what my vision is and blah, blah. But then on the numbers, people had to be there to do the numbers and the marketing. You know, I that's I don't own those places. Yep. So I was there for the broad picture and the CFO was there for the nitty gritty. Or and bring your accountant, bring your bookkeeper, bring anybody who knows numbers, unless you know numbers, in which case you're set, you're all set. Uh, again, I feel like you all are teeing me up perfectly because Ramona, you know, numbers <laughs> and uh you have used debt to finance your business. You shared that in our Bootstrapping 101 webinar. And you said that business owners should not be afraid of debt. Why, why is that? Why is debt beneficial? How can we rethink our relationship with it? 
Yes, and, and I can see that Claudia is not afraid of debt. No. <laughs> That's Embrace amazing. the debt. <laughs> I, I also, I borrowed too. I took the PPP loan. Well, that was forgiven. I took the idle loan. I, I have a line of credit. I think that having that, again, safety net, having that, that um, backup plan, if net profits are low in one given season or a given month, if you have an, ex an expense that you weren't uh, planning for, you have that loan or line of credit that you can turn to in an emergency and then panic, it's not going to interfere with you running your business and growing your business. The only thing I always recommend is making sure that before you get into debt, you know how you will pay it back, that you can plan the repayment, that you're not getting a, a high interest rate that is so high that it's going to damage your business and it's going to eat into the profits to the extent that then you become unprofitable. Um, it's just keep in mind those points, but having debt is always a safe option because then you don't get into panic mode when an emergency comes up. And I have a line of credit with the second bank. I have a loan with the SBA. And sometimes I say, should I pay it back? But it's only 3.75. Why not keep the money in case I can, you know, I need to hire a larger team in the next tax season. So it sounds like like the relationship with debt, it can be used in so many different ways. And it's about really creating these different um, different pockets and safety nets and approaches to the way that your business is going to grow and succeed. Yes, definitely. And I think having just having that, I, I see a comment where someone said they get nervous with debt, right? Yeah. If you have it as a backup plan and it's not the go-to option, it's not as scary. If we depend on debt, then that's when it gets nerve breaking. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, someone asked a great question along the way here, which is, you know, do you recommend having a financial mentor? How do we find one for our business? And I feel like Ramona, this is right up your alley. This is the space you work in. So what is your recommendation to everybody um, around financial mentors and what they should look for in a mentor? I think peer advisors are great for the fields where we are not strong in. If you find other business owners, let's say I find Claudia and, and she is great with debt management, I would be reaching out to her, right? Like as if we are if we become friend or friendly. So go to your peer, the one that have been there before. But formal mentors, um, I think that going through organizations like SCORE or WNYC, Women Entrepreneurs of New York City, the ones that are offering mentors on a, not a one-on-one, -on -one, but they are there to advise you on different situations that you go through. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one mentorship, sometimes I find that over time, it kind of dies away or out because people get either you know over be, overly busy and, and it becomes a lot or there is no more to talk about um, after a few sessions so I think that go to as you need mentorship is a better option mm -hmm. great and before I dig back into some of these more financial nitty-gritties yeah Claudia you have a business coach why has that been beneficial for for you and um, how has that kind of helped with the big picture I know don't know I just hired him last week <laughs> what did you look for so honestly, this is what happened. I'm on social media. A friend of mine who was another CPG brand owner started around the same time I did. She was doing a shout out to this person who said, this person helped me get from five digits to seven in a year. And I was like, who is this person? And I need to know them right now. So I reached out to him and I joined this network called um, Pinnacle Global Network. So far, my coach, I've had one meeting with it. It's really getting down into the numbers. What is the plan? How can I help? I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure exactly where it's going yet since I've only had one meeting, but my intent is to get to seven digits by the end of this year with the help of this coach. And the reason I chose a coach now versus before is I've been lucky enough to have mentorship since 2019. I went through Goldman Sachs program, 20, 10,000 small business. It's a great program for people starting a business. I went, I was a lucky recipient of the Stacy's Rise grant and mentorship with PepsiCo Frito-Lay in 20, Tori Birch in 21, Ladies Who Launch in 22. And I'm like, now it's 23, what am I gonna do? I want some one-on-one -on -one me coaching because it's time for me to take off. Yeah. 
Caitlin, I'm going to ask you a similar question because a lot of folks are saying in the chat, you know, what a creative way to approach your business. Like, did you have an advisor, a lawyer who was helping you with some of these creative approaches to it all? Yes. Um, I have the privilege of being married to my <laughs> uh, CFO, who also is in finance. I'm happy to link his inst or not his Instagram, his LinkedIn in the bottom because he actually does consulting with small businesses and he'd be happy to chat with anyone. But he's the one that helped me create the structure. I definitely did not have the business savvy or like I wouldn't have found that on my own. Um, I probably would have known angel investors and in equity. I wouldn't have known kind of these other like tranche deals and a debt facility and kind of these other structures that I've done. Yeah. So, I mean, I think what's amazing is just, uh, again, to the, you know, bring the folks to the meeting to help with yes. uh, securing the dollars, but also like seek out uh, the resources, the guidance, talk to folks like Ramona talk to business coaches to really understand, you know, all the, the things you might not see as the founder. Um, yes. Now, Claudia, I'm going to come back to you. Um, you shared with us before that because of business needs and decisions along the way, you ended up at one point turning to a loan that you found to be predatory. What were some of the red flags you wish you had seen? Oi. Where to start? Okay, I'm gonna frame. I'm gonna frame the situation. It's 2020, March of 2020. I was 99.9% .9 B2B hospitality. That's all I was. I was going to pivot to direct to consumer online and grocery by virtue of what I learned with Goldman Sachs to diversify my income streams. I was in pivot when I lost all my revenue overnight. Now, I doubled down on my pivot. I raised money through debt and grants. I've never done equity so far. Debt and grants, lots of grants, forgivable loans, that kind of thing. Um, I raised money and then I got the Stacy's Rise project, right? So that's CPG. So it's CPG all the time. And all we're talking about is you gotta get into grocery, you gotta get into UNFI, you gotta get a broker, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta. So I do, because I do what I'm told. And I get a broker and I get a distributor and they almost put me out of business because nobody tells you about the downfall of that. In order to get into national distribution, you have to have a lot of money. And you also have to have, you also have to be prepared to not get paid for two years. Didn't know that. Get a big old PO, so excited. Don't have the money to buy the raw materials. Kind of desperate. Another big tip for everybody out there, by the way, don't go for debt when you're desperate. That's the worst time in the world. You want to anticipate your cash flow needs and you want to plan for them because when you're up against the wall, you will do something stupid like get a fintech loan, which is what I did. And you have the red flag when someone says, I can fund you tomorrow. All you have to do is show me your bank statements for the last three months. Right then and there, you know you're going to have a usurious predatory loan and they're not going to talk about APR. They're going to say, I'm going to give you $100,000 tomorrow. Tomorrow. And all you have to do is pay $2,200 a week back for 18 months. Do the math, you have an APR of 65%. You're screwed. One, and two, the only way a FinTech loan will ever work, ever, 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 is you never use it to fund a UNFI PO because you're not gonna get paid on the PO. Two, you do not want to use a FinTech loan to fund growth because you don't know if it's gonna happen. And the only way it'll work is if that growth happens. If that growth doesn't happen, that loan has put you out of business. Mm -hmm. Resounding theme is really understanding why you're using the debt, what you're using it for um, in order to grow. And I feel, Ramona, I see you. Do you want to add some commentary here? I have seen some of those loans. And when my, my clients send me this email, oh, I'm getting this loan from X merchant and I have to pay back. 17% of sales over 18 months, I do the math. I'm like, you're paying this loan twice. Why would you do that? So that's why I was nodding because those are, you need to stay away from those. And Gloria is totally right. The reason we turn to those is desperation. So let's get the line of credit earlier when you don't need it. You only pay an annual fee, a small annual fee to have it. And you only pay interest if you use it. The line of credit is a, very 
cheap, low cost way to have debt available to you. And, and loans that you, when, if you have good credit and you get the loans for something that is a project that you know is going to generate the revenue to pay it back, then apply for that early, know when you're desperate to hire the resources. Yeah, certainly. And there's something I, I wanted to comment on in there because I think, you know, often just at the foundation, we see entrepreneurs go through every program out there and available. And I beyond encourage you to seek out the programs, the accelerators, the incubators that are right for your business, but don't feel pressure to chase, right? Like if there is a, a program and it's designed to encourage you to end up in X retail or end up in doing grocery, for example, it doesn't mean that that program is a bad program. You just have to mirror or find that sweet spot of what is right for your business. And then what are the objectives of that accelerator um, mm -hmm. or that program? And don't feel pressure to change your business strategy just because it might be encouraged in one program or another. Um, it's something we talk to founders a lot about. I know, Claudia, we've you know, our team has had many conversations over the years with all different founders about that in general. Um, so really sticking true to what is going to make sense for your business growth and strategy. Take the advice that feels relevant and makes sense for where you want to go um, and really um, trust your instincts. Get outside perspective. Like you don't have to ask the person just in the accelerator if X, Y, Z is going to be right for you. Um, so I just want to share that nugget because it's something that we kind of encounter or hear about quite a bit. Um, Ramona, I want to ask you a follow-up question just around the entire concept of bootstrapping. It's something that you, you know, you had an amazing webinar. I encourage everyone to go back and watch that if they want to dig deep into the tips about bootstrapping. But what would you say are some of the like, if you were to give five things that somebody should be like checking off the list um, of how to approach that good financial management for self-funding, which is what bootstrapping is. Yes, I, I covered, I think, and I did this in the webinar. The first thing I want everyone to do is to make sure their billing and revenue management is optimized. So not having clients that are not paying you for two years, not continuing to service them and, and not getting paid, that is a no-no. Get rid, rid of that, rid of those clients. But really having a good billing process for billing timely, having good terms with your clients, clear terms on payments, and collecting timely, and the pricing of your products and services is key. If you're underpricing, everything else is going to fail. So let's fix that. The second thing is uh, the credit, of course, personal credit, business credit, building that. Um, the third recommendation I have is having a good cash flow needs analysis done, like Claudia said. If, if I don't know how much money I need for the rest of the year, how am I going to manage it? If I have a project to you know, next year with a, a, an amazing foundation or organization, and I'm going to fund that, where is the money coming from? So we need to really create that cash flow needs analysis or cash flow projection and maintain it on a regular basis. And the resources that we're using, yes, let's use the free resources. I'm a big fan of the programs. I did the Goldman Sachs program. I did the Columbia Business um, Community Program. And I do that with uh, strategy. And, and I, I love that you said that, Molly, because if we do all of them, we're giving away our time, time that we are not using to sell and to manage our businesses. Um, but if we have an end goal in mind, like for me, to give you an example, is I know the community that's in those programs afterwards can be my clients. I know that they have a way to market to them. So it's a no brainer, but I didn't do the programs for that, but that is an, a, an added benefit. Mm -hmm. And um, the last thing is really to um, work on how to diversify the revenue if we can and analyze what the profitability is for each revenue stream. Just because you can sell five products, it does not mean that you're making money from each of them. So you need to understand how much is costing you, the pricing, and make sure that all of them are profitable. Otherwise, get rid of the one that's not, unless it's bringing clients for the other product. Amazing. Um, well, you all have been very generous answering the questions that, um, 
full credit, the Tory Birch Foundation team had seen through webinars over the past few months and put together. Um, but I want to dig into some questions that came in as people registered and the things that are popping up in the chat right now. So um, for each of you, I want to rewind early days of the business. Um, did you slash how did you factor in paying yourself into that strategy as you started? Um, so, I mean, Caitlin, why don't we start with you and then we'll go around the horn. Claudia, we're, we're buckled up. We're ready to hear it too. But go ahead, Caitlin. <laughs> um, let's see. I think in the early days, I, I was able to pay myself initially. It was when I started expanding and bringing on more uh, employees is when I then had to kind of like make the decision about at some point paying them or paying me um, and they won. <laughs> um, so I got scrappy. I lived in the back of my fitness studio for three years at one point to not pay rent so I could funnel everything back into the business. Um, but at some point you have to see like you can't pour from an empty cup, right? You have to take care of yourself in order to be able to kind of provide for the business. So I did that because, you know, my employees mean a lot to me. I wanted to keep them. It was a sacrifice I was willing to make for a, a long period of time. That was a rough three years. Um, but once I was able to get the business to a point, I then made the, you know, the decision that I needed to pay myself in order to be the best I could for the business. Um, I knew I was at that point from a cash flow perspective. Um, of course, that completely changed again when COVID hit and I had to cut back down when COVID hit. I kept all my employees through COVID, which I'm very proud of, uh, kept all the studios, but I had to pivot multiple times and see what I could be flexible in in order to keep my team. Um, and I'm really proud of that, that I did that. But I will say, you know, you are worthy of <laughs> your salary. Um, you just have to make sure that it is, um, it works for the business. Make sure it's, you know, you're at a place in the business that the business can afford it. And if not, how do you baby step your way there? What do you have to do? What sacrifices do you have to make to get there? Yeah. And Ramona, do you want to add on? I mean, you are, I'm sure, advising businesses constantly about how to take the, the owner's draw, so to speak. <laughs> yes. So as a service provider, I think all service providers should aim at paying themselves right away, right? Otherwise, if you are the one bringing all the revenue, I definitely encourage you to get paid. Um, when you are depending on volume and like product sales or in the case of Caitlin, maybe you needed to bring in uh, other trainers, then that's a little different because you have to create a volume to generate the profit to be able to pay yourself. So if you if that makes you everyone out there that's in the situation feel better, that it's okay. So we need to work on the volume so that uh, we can pay ourselves. In terms of how much to pay um, the owners, it's, it's going to depend on how the business is doing. The stages are going to be different. The business needs to be able to absorb your salary without going on the negative. Um, so I always recommend looking at what is the profit before you take a salary and then how much do we need to leave in the business so that it can run for the next couple of months and then take as much as you can within the market you know, limits of, for that salary. Amazing. Thank you. And and Claudia, do you have anything you add before we go on to further questions? Salary? What salary? <laughs> I've never paid myself. In fact, I've liquidated my IRA to keep my business afloat. So I have taken, so a couple things. Okay. One, sadly, I am not motivated by money. I never have been ever in my life. So that's a drag because, you know, <laughs> I kind of suck at profit, you know, I kind of suck at number crunching if you, because what I care about is the quality of my coffee and more importantly, how much money I'm giving back to animal welfare organizations around the country. So 
I give back, I give back, I pay, I give money every week to a rescue or sanctuary around the country and I don't pay myself. Yeah. My play here is someday I will grow this company and I will exit and I will get the money back and then some. This is my hope. In the meantime, if I ever take on equity capital or I get super successful, which is the intent, um, I will start paying myself. But right now, like I say to my poor husband, he thought he was marrying a lawyer. He married a entrepreneur who started a manufacturing company. So <laughs> thanks to my honey, I live a nice life, but I don't pay myself. All right. Well, you know what, Claudia, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. We had some people say, Claudia's got the real goods. You're you're being honest with everybody and we're, we're here for it. Um, we had another question come in. Um, specifically about debt. And Ramona, I want to pass that one to you. Um, so the question is, would you take on debt in order to obtain more sales or accounts? So for our service-based businesses out there, especially like, what are you, what's your advice? I think Claudia made a great point on this before. Like if you're funding marketing or sales, you don't know if the money is going to come in. I wouldn't, I wouldn't fund that with debt. I would fund something like a project that I want with the city and I need to deliver on X, you know, number of, of hours of work and I need to fund the resources for that project, I would take out debt for that. Uh, if there is, if I'm having a hard time collecting and I have a receivable of $50,000 and I know that I'm, I'm going to collect 80% of that over the next few months, I can borrow because I know the money is going to come in. So there are a bunch of examples. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily fund something that is, let's see how it goes, kind of thing, um, unless you have, you know, a good amount of a good probability of making it happen. Yeah, and I guess a, a follow up, a deviation. So in in funding something like that, or in you know, when should we be using grants? to fund different elements of the business. All the time. <laughs> you can get them. Tell us more. <laughs> if we can get them, right? If we can get them. So I, I have gotten a few grants because as, as a firm, we are we have everything organized. You know, fortunately we are in finance. So we have our financials in order and our receipts and we can document everything quickly. So we were one of the first ones to get a New York City grant when COVID hit because, and it was around for just like a few weeks before PPP got in. Um, I jumped on it. I that the um, one of the grants that Tory Burch um, Foundation sponsors. I recently got one with the Westchester County, and I love them. So what do I do with those grants? I use that to hire. So tax season was coming on. I wanted to have a, a senior accountant. I'm using part of my grant for that. And I think it's great because otherwise I would have hesitated to hire that person, right? So I'm, I'm using that, you know, to give someone a job. This person hasn't been working for five years and now she's going to work with us. So I think that the timing is anytime, as long as you have a good purpose for it, if you take it and use it and waste it, it's not going to make a difference. It, there has to be some plan on how to make it work for your business. Great. I want to I want to ask each of you I guess as we dig in around grants and different programs that you've been involved in um some have grants attached some don't how did you go about finding them because we are constantly asked you know Tory Burch Foundation send us the full list of all the grants in the world and we're like it just it doesn't exist and it takes some research so how did you all research and find the programs that have helped you Hello Alice all right. Hello, Alice is a great um, source of grants, as is NAV, mm -hmm. joining NAV. Um, and I, I just, I, I have a link to a Google Doc full of grants I can put in this chat yes. if I can find it. Uh, yeah. For me, it was Hello, Alice. And it was, I luckily had friends during COVID who knew that I was. I had no revenue coming in and they were trying to help me and they were researching grants and constantly giving me grants to apply to. Mm -hmm. Amazing. What about you, Caitlin? I know that you've done our fellowship program. How'd you find programs like that? Um, yes, I've done a uh, Tory Birch fellowship. I forget how I found you guys. I think from a previous fellow. Um, I've also done some pitch competitions like SoGal, 
Um, so I've actually done more pitch competitions and things like that than grants. I'll be completely honest. I've been very unsuccessful with grants. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm definitely doing it wrong. So I'm not the great person to ask. Um, I, I have applied to many and gotten pretty much zero. Um, so Claudia, it's amazing that you've gotten some and Ramona, if you have, but I, I'm doing it wrong. So I'll, I'll pass the <laughs> buck on this one. <laughs> I'm the queen of grant writing. I, I need your help. I am not good at grant writing. <laughs> Amazing, Rona. Can I add, Mal? Yes, can I add something to that? So, I Hello Islands is a great resource. I do find that because their audience is so large, the the chances of you getting it will be probably small. So, what I do yeah. is that is search online for grants that not every they are not being advertised to a massive newsletter. So, FedEx has a grant going on right now. Mm -hmm. We don't qualify. I don't think we do. So that's the other thing, Kaylin, applying for the right grants. They, there is a fine print that says the business has shipping needs. I don't have shipping needs. So why am I going to apply for that one, right? It's $25,000. They're going to give it to a few business owners. But if you have a business that requires shipping their products, that might be a good grant for you. And that one is not, maybe it's not in Hello Alice where a thousand people are going to apply. So th that's, we search it up online. I use an intern, one of my staff to search every other week for grants that are out there. And then we look at the qualifications very carefully and then apply. Yep. Exactly. I apply like every week for grants. <laughs> it's just and, your calendar. <laughs> and we do include these grants on our newsletters. So if you want to sign up for our newsletter, everything <laughs> is right there. Go to fibric.com and sign up. Amazing. Yeah, and I think, I think such a great point is knowing what do you want to use the grant for? It's certainly something that we're, when, when we have grants and we're assessing, you know, who, who is eligible, we're looking for that sweet spot. And I would say most, uh, most organizations are, have you expressed a clear need for the grant? Have you also been clear about how your business will use it and told your business story, which goes back to what Caitlin was saying earlier, knowing your why, whether you're seeking investors or grant funding, like we're all looking for that why, your founder story, um, because it all paints the bigger picture of this is a grant and an investment that is going to further the business. And that's what most organizations are looking for, whether it's furthering for shipping needs, furthering for general use funds. Um, so having that in the back of your mind is great. Um, we have a lot more questions. So let me just pull up a couple more. Um, uh, I guess, Ramona, one, one question that's come in is, you know, uh, bootstrapping is great. Self-funding is great. What are some of the pitfalls? I, you know, it's probably just that, that those moments where you're going to wonder where the money's coming from, right? Uh, if you have investors and big loans out there that you're not afraid to use, maybe you you don't have concerns about where is my payroll going to come from in the next few months? It's just that, I think, having, knowing that you depend on yourself and your business and that like everything has to flow the way you're planning it. Uh, the uncertainty, I think, sometimes can be a little concerning, but um, besides that, I think it's great to be on your own. You don't have to respond to investors and, and lenders if you don't need the money and or family members <laughs> that are expected looking at you at the family dinner like, okay, how is the business going? <laughs> Yes, family families are best advocates and are worst all at the same time. And I'm pretty sure that we've had some great webinars if you dig back about co-founders and family and navigating relationships. So uh, it, folks tuning in, definitely go back through our, our YouTube. Uh, there's some, some great advice there. Um, Caitlin, I, I have a follow-up question for you. So uh, someone has asked, really, uh, did you, were you worried at all about giving up control it, when bringing other people on a, around investment in the business, like, and and did you ultimately end up giving up real control? Like, what has that been like? Yeah, um, I think finding investors, which again goes back to really articulating your why again, and finding investors that are aligned with that. I make it very clear that we are a purpose-driven company. Um, we're people and people and purpose focused first. I take care of my trainers because they're the ones that are delivering 
the product and the product, what I mean by that is the service to the women. Um, and I'm very much like Claudia. Um, I'm more driven by how many women we can impact versus the money in the bank account. Doesn't mean I don't want to get my investors a return and I will get my investors a return. I mean, my parents were my first investors. They want that return. <laughs> um, and like Claudia, I'm waiting for that, like it all being worth it when I have an exit and I can pay myself. Um, but finding, and I haven't given up the amount, like I still own majority of the company, which is great, which is also an upside of having angel investors versus traditional VCs. Um, so I still own the majority. Um, I do have majority control and I've just been very articulate with what I'm looking for for an investor. Like, this is what I'm looking for. This is our mission. If you align, fantastic. Um, and obviously you do have to come from that of a point of, again, kind of like the debt not up out of desperation, right? Like probably many of us have been in a point where we need funding. So like you can, you might not be able to be as, um, <laughs> as nitpicky as other times when you're desperate. But if you can fundraise when you don't need it and you can be articulate, articulate your vision, your why, where you want to take the company, show a return, but let people know that you're going to, like your mission for me, my mission is to impact new, um, new and expecting mothers. It's to make uh, stable careers for my trainers. And then the upside is I'm going to get you a return. So we're going to make a ton of impact and then I'm going to get you a return. And if you're down with that, come on board. Otherwise, hopefully I'm not in a position, I am in the position where I can say no if they don't jive. Yeah, I mean, that's it's great advice for everybody um, and couldn't be more true. A lot of businesses that you ultimately see shift from what was originally the thing that made them special is sometimes VC, you know, VC investor funding has come on board and, and the goal is different and it changed. And it doesn't mean all VC is bad, yeah. but it does go back to that that sweet spot of, are you aligned in yeah. what you both want to see for the business? Mm -hmm. um, so Shannon over here in the Q&A box is a new business, um, something we all, all of you can relate to at different points. Uh, good credit, but no income yet. Is there loans for first timers like that? Um, what is that like? And I, I know we've learned a lot along the way at Tory Birch Foundation, that a lot of banks are expecting at least two years in business that you need to be showing profitability. What are some of the options then for somebody at that early stage? And I don't know if this is something, Ramona, you maybe want to jump in on first or, or Claudia in your experience, but. Mm. That's a tough one because even grants often require a certain amount of time in business mm -hmm. to not be, have any income or any revenue um, and good credit. I mean, I, I honestly, the only thing that's coming to my mind is that I would get a credit card or a line of credit at the bank if the bank will give you a personal line of credit even, and then you use it for your business or get, if you own a home, which you might, you probably don't, but if you did, I would try for a line of credit off the house. Mm -hmm. Ramona, anything to follow up on that one? Oh, you know what? I think we lost your audio. Yeah. Yes, loans, most loans at the beginning will be anyways guaranteed by the personal credit. So taking a credit at the personal level would be almost the same as um, a loan at the personal level would be almost the same as getting a business loan in the first few years. However, I'll be concerned and uh, with this um, person taking a loan when there is no income. So that's like the second part of this, which maybe we don't want to get into, but I would be hesitant to take on a loan if there isn't a good plan on how we're going to be able to pay that back. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Um, and so, you know, I'm very conscious of time and you all have been so generous uh, to Tory Birch Foundation, to everybody attending today. Um, uh, so I'm going to try and squeeze in one more question um, for you, Ramona. Um, how do you fundraise for a service-based business? Because a lot of people are service-based businesses. 
there have been a few service-based businesses, uh, catering services, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, there is, you know, there is the story of Chief, the organization that provides networking for women in New York. They started in New York. There are a bunch of service businesses that have funded, uh, VC funded. There is a great story behind it. There is a growth path that they can show. Um, there, there are businesses out there. We have clients that have gone fundraising, but it's going to not be based on, I'm going to have a hundred clients paying me $200 for the next five years. I'm not going to get anything from that, right? It's, I have to show massive growth potential in order to get people to invest in, in the company. Great. Well, uh, before we depart, I'd love to give you each an opportunity to share just the most important piece of advice you personally have learned on your funding your business journey um, that you would give to everybody tuning in. Um, so why don't we why don't we start with you, Claudia, and we'll go around the horn to, to close it out. You have to know your numbers. Mm -hmm. You need to know your numbers. You need to know your numbers per revenue stream. These, by the way, these are all things I didn't know. I know it now. Understand cash flow, understand how critical cash flow is. And don't make decisions out of desperation. And don't do something just because someone tells you to. Oh, you're a CPG brand. Well, you've got to be in every grocery store. No, I don't. No, I don't. I can do online. I can do hospitality. I can be in some grocery stores. I don't have to be in every grocery store. I'd like to be down the road, but not, not until you can afford it. And don't, I cannot stress enough how you do not want to get national distribution in the grocery chains unless you have the money to, serve, to do that. Yeah. And you have to budget for that. You have to hire someone to figure out what it's going to cost you to actually get through that experience. That's great advice. Uh, Caitlin, any parting, parting words? Yeah, I, I think connecting to your why. Um, I think also using your uh, investor updates to re-engage investors once you get your initial tranche of investors. I've had many investors come back in again. So using your investor updates as a potential for them to come back in. Um, and then I think be flexible. Not everyone needs VC funding. That might not be a right fit for you. Be um, able to pivot, know the current environment we're in. Um, I'm doing real revenue now, but I still did a tranche deal because of the um, current climate. So I'm not trying to raise off like I'm doing almost four million in revenue. I'm not trying to raise off eight million dollar valuation. I'm trying to like let's tranche this out. I'm going to prove myself because I understand the the economic climate we're in. So being flexible with the time, don't think you have to do VCs or I'm doing this, I have to do this X amount of revenue, crowdfunding, debt, revenue participation, be flexible. Great. And Ramona, parting advice for everyone. Yes, for all the service providers out there or those that are selling to other businesses on credit, please be mindful of collections. Um, especially when you have a client that seems to be your best client and they don't pay you for two or three months. I have experienced this with one or two clients where there were friend clients that after 10 months of not paying, I found that they were going out of business or they just were not going to pay. And it's a, it's a hard lesson to learn, especially as a, as a CPA, as a financial expert. But once you learn from the lesson, then it never happens again. Just learn from it. I'm telling you because it happened to me. And what happens, the worst part is that it's not about what you don't collect. It's that the fact that I could have been doing something else with that time that I invested in that client. I could have had my team working on 10 clients, right, that were not paying well. So I, that's why I stick so much to the collections. Don't let your invoices go older than 15 days. That's it. <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, Ramona, Claudia, Caitlin, I, I mean, I cannot thank you all enough. You've been so generous with your stories and your time and just sharing expertise with our incredible community. Um, and to everybody who tuned in, thank you for being here. 